Hello everyone, welcome to this new video in our series on feature engineering. And what we have seen in the last video was the first approach to identify features from data in a linear fashion. Right? And this was the singular value decomposition, or where well, we use the singular value decomposition for feature extraction. And this video is going to be about autoencoders. Right? And well, maybe you're wondering why am I writing this about SVD in so much detail once more, but we will see in a second that there actually is a very close relation in spirit at least. Okay, so what we did in SVD is we found this matrix of left singular vectors U, and then we picked the first R leading columns of this, right? because these were the dominant feature vectors or basis vectors um, with the largest singular values, and this meant that these contained the most information. And so the features that we then extracted, the Z tilde, was just the projection of our input Z onto these coordinates. Right? So it's always the inner product between the ith vector times the vector Z gives us the ith component in our feature vector. Okay. And so if you then want to go back, you do the reverse if you wish. Okay? So you take your reduced state Z, so the features Z1, Z tilde 1 to Z tilde R, and these are just our coefficients for the associated basis functions or the, the columns of our U matrix. And this heads us back to the full state, the original state. Okay. And so the second step is only a, let's say, post-processing step, right? What you would usually want to do is you extract these features that hopefully have more meaning than the individual entries of Z, and then do some sort of learning on these reduced features. And to have an interpretation in terms of the original input, this is the way back to the full size data. All right, and so let's take a look at the composition of these two, okay? So what happens if we just consider both steps together? And then it's very easy to see that you apply UR to Z tilde, which is this uh, matrix vector product. So what we get is UR times Z tilde, which is UR transposed Z. Okay, and this takes us back to the original space, but now obviously it's not exact because we only took a subset of features. So this is not equality, but this is approximately the Z term, right? And so now let's like take a look at the visual version of this, okay? So let's consider this, our input vector Z can potentially be very, very high dimensional. Uh, let's say that this is Q real numbers, can be a very large vector. We have seen this in, in the sea surface temperature example and in these fluid or phase examples. And then we reduce this to our little state Z tilde. All right, this is our Z tilde. And this is a number, or oh, has R entries, right? The number of reduced vectors that we took. And then we go back to the original state, or to an approximation thereof, but it has at least the same dimension as our Z vector, okay? So you see, this is sort of a, a projection onto a lower dimension space, and then we go back. And so if you look at the mathematical operations, what you really do to get the first entry of Z, uh, Z tilde, excuse me, you take the first vector and multiply the Z with it from the left. Okay, so all the entries from Z enter in this via our matrix U, or the first column of U, right? So these three would together, you know, be the entries of U1. Right? And we, then we can proceed in a very similar way to go until the Rth vector, right? So if I'm going here now, then these pink ones will be the weights of my rth vector, all right? And then I go back, right? And so what I'm doing is basically the same thing. Okay, so now these take me back, and you see that the ur matrix is what, you know, have to be the, the numbers or the weights uh, along these edges. And so now if we look at this, this looks kind of familiar, right? And so here's the thing, this is a neural network. Z 
So, well, uh, uh, let's say a simple one because we have a single hidden layer and we don't have an activation function or the activation function is, is the identity matrix of identity function. So a non-identification one hidden layer neural network or simply a linear neural network if you wish. Okay, so we omitted the nonlinearity. However, it is a neural network. Okay, so this was a lengthy introduction, but now we take the small step only to get to the outer encoder. Okay, and so the idea is basically the same. We have a large input vector, we have the same output size, and we have this intermediate layer that should be smaller because it should contain meaningful features. And so the outer encoder, or AE uh, in short, just has a simple strategy, make the network larger. Right? And nonlinear. So I can do the same thing. All I have to do is I have to increase the number by larger, I mean more layers. And by nonlinear, I mean to add activation functions. But you see, basically, the same concept now. We have this input layer, which is q-dimensional. We have an intermediate layer, which is r-dimensional. This is what we would call the bottleneck, because this is really the smallest one. And then we have our output layer, which is, again, of this high dimension. Only thing that changes now is we get intermediate layers of different sizes, and we may also get intermediate layer of, let's say, increasing sizes usually towards the output, right? So what we get is this type of structure that we have a reduction in dimension, and then we have, again, an increase in dimension, okay? And so this is what we call the, deco uh, the encoder, excuse me, the encoder, because what we do, we take the input, we encode it into a latent space, uh, some representative in, in a smaller dimension space, and then we have the decoder that takes us back to the original state, okay? And so why is this so powerful um, architecture? The idea is actually exactly the same as in the SVD, only that we have a nonlinear function. And so the task is to take us down to a small dimensional space and then take us back to the original space. And this bottleneck really contains the information that we need <clears throat> because in order to have a lossless reconstruction or almost lossless reconstruction, we need to be able to compress all the information in this input into this lower dimensional feature vector, right? So in order to have a loss, small, small loss reconstruction, all the information has to be compressed into this bottleneck layer. And so the idea is, as we said, very similar, only that we here have a nonlinear problem, okay? And so for the training, there's again a close relation, right? What we said in, in training, in, in, in the SVD problem, this was a closed form solution, but we also formalized this as an optimization problem, if you remember. We said minimize over the set of R vectors, or so matrix with, with R columns, and do the following, you should go over all my samples and then minimize the distance between each sample and the decoder, encoder, sorry, the encoder, decoder, sequence, uh, so compression and, and going back. So minimize the distance between the original input and the compression and going back. And so really, if you can do this, we saw, found that the singular vectors really solve this problem. But the same thing can now be done for the outer encoder, okay? So what we can do is, and I'm going to call this E and D simply, um, and these are represented by the neural network weights. So minimize over the encoder weights and the decoder weights, and now the very same thing, right? Take the sum over all your samples, and then we have the difference between the input and the decoder applied to the encoded input, okay? So exactly this, encode, this is E of Z, and then decode D of E of Z. 
and then we minimize this distance, right? And so this is a very, very powerful architecture for feature extraction, right? So the second part is actually not needed in terms of the feature. So after we have trained this, usually the first part will serve as our feature matrix psi, right? So the encoder is what will be our psi of z in the end, right? And this will give us the z tilde here. But for training, you need both of them. And the second part is then important, you know, if you do some learning of the features or maybe time series, time stepping, then you can get back to the original state using the decoder. So the advantage is that it is, uh, can have much higher compression rates due to the nonlinearity, and it can also handle nonlinear transforms, right? So stronger compression, and nonlinearity. So what do I mean by the second? If you think about a coordinate transform that we had in the SVD, we always had this case that you are just, you know, in a linear algebra way, just rotate your coordinate system into a meaningful way. But if you now have data sets that are shaped in, you know, not as ellipses, then what you actually need is you need coordinate transforms that may be curved, okay? And so this is something that the SVD will never give you. You can only get, a, so let's say, and you need coordinates along the main, you know, structure of your system. Clearly, this is a nonlinear function, so SVD will never give you this. And so, you know, nonlinearity is a powerful advantage. Compression can be increased. Negative part is that it's obviously less interpretable because you get these abstract features and you cannot immediately say that these are, you know, a set of these, let's say, eigenfaces in our example or these coherent structures and fluids and so on. However, it's a very popular alternative that is getting more and more important in, in all sorts of applications where you want to compress states of dynamical systems and then proceed with, let's say, learning time series or something related. All right, I hope this gives you a very high level, but still, you know, understandable introduction to autoencoders and we will see you in the next video and talk about nonlinear features in, in deep learning in general. Thank you.